All right, good morning. Um, welcome. Uh, my name is Murray Howe, I work for Adobe, and I'll be your host uh, for the next hour and a quarter. Um, I'd like to provide you some context for why we're here in this session. Uh, like I'm guessing many of you in the room, uh, I'm a marketer. I've been a marketer my whole career. And um, up to a certain point, I thought I was doing a really good job and that any disconnect that I um, saw between me and my business uh, wasn't marketing's fault, it was the fault of the business, until someone came along who I really trusted and said, uh, you marketing guys and girls, uh, you exist in your own bubble. You know, you're optimising to your own outcomes and no one understands the thing that you're talking about. And I realised, um, and maybe you've come to this similar realisation, that um, it's something that we, well, I've been guilty of forgetting in the past, is that for a lot of our brands, the money they invest in marketing and media is probably the top one to five expense items for that company. And so as custodians of that investment, we have a real responsibility to make sure that we're investing that money to outcomes that the business cares about. Uh, and more importantly, that we communicate the progress and the success of those investments in a way that they can understand and appreciate. Which brings us uh, to the title of, of the session today, Meaningless Media Metrics and the Changing Agency Model. And so the session today, a presentation, um, followed by a panel, will attempt to unpack that a little bit more and shed some light on, on what we think the current state of that relationship is and what people are doing well to bridge that connection and maybe you share some ideas and get your involvement as to what things we can be doing to improve that relationship. To lead us in that conversation, I'd like uh, you to join me in welcoming to this stage uh, Michaela. And Michaela is the uh, head of solutions and she's also a long time digital pioneer for Havas Helia. So please welcome to the stage, Michaela. Michaela, thank you. Um. Thank, thank you all, and uh, to come back to the question of pioneer for the ones who don't know me, I have worked in digital for 30 years, and I have a long-standing relationship with Adobe. In 1993, I published a book, the Australian Web Developers Directory. I was using a software called PageMaker, which doesn't exist anymore, and I submitted to the printer a PDF file, which was pretty amazing. 25 years ago, and as we all know, since then, technology and the learning curve was just uh, amazing for all of us. So, um, let's dive into this session. I want to keep it. I want to keep it light. And before I talk more, I have I have a very bad habit of being direct. So I try to soften the blow. And uh, what I'm saying to you, see this as an observation and not necessarily a criticism of how you do business. But I hope at the end of this session you walk away thinking, well, there is something that I can change about how I measure and how I report to my business. You know, if I'm too direct or I say something you don't want to hear, just raise your arm. The uh, room is small enough, so I will, I will, I will sort of rephrase my comments. So over the next 30 minutes, I just want to show you the tip of the iceberg and hope you look, uh, you look below the surface um, uh, within your organization and change how you measure going forward. Ah, my clicker. There you go. I need two hands for this. So today's agenda, I want to share theories, how we actually got to the point where we started to measure more or less uh, meaningless things and how can we turn the conversation around from what can we measure to actually what should we measure. I will also show you three examples of clients that we work with where we have to try to, to change that and really look at uh, more meaningful uh, metrics for them. And then at the end of this session, I will just give you a few pointers how you can talk internally or to your agency to, to change that. So how did, how, did, how did we get here? So how did we get to a point where we actually measure efficiency and not effectiveness, where we measure everything in between the product and the sale, 
rather than concentrate on the numbers that get us uh, to our business goals or what you would call actionable data. To do that, I want to go back in time and um, illustrate what actually happened in the past that we got to this point. So in the beginning, it was simple. It wasn't hard at all. You had a product and a brief. You know, the categories were well, well understood. It was um, the case that the audiences were predictable. There was less fragmentation. You know, it was pretty cruisy for agencies. Also, in terms of media buying, there wasn't really a lot of choice like today. There wasn't social. You had TV. You had print. You had out of home. You had radio. And everyone was there. Also, considering that those, uh, for example, TV wasn't on 24-7. There was no streaming. You know, and all of those channels had more or less the same advantage. So the content that we produced um, was also fairly, fairly simple and easy to adjust. When you look at your audience, uh, not only were the audience predictable, they were also easy to, easy to reach. As marketers, uh, I'm sure many of you have seen Mad Men, you just created a, an amazing message, you put it on TV and everyone was watching it um, regardless if, uh, if it was talking to that particular segment or not. And keep in mind when you see this, um, this is probably what many of your parents uh, saw on TV. So that is actually not that long ago. Looking at how media was bought, again, super easy. You had the brand, a bucket of money. They gave it to an agency who bought TV. They called via telephone the publisher and off you went. You know, there was no, uh, no other intermediaries. Um, in, in media buying, pretty clear. Also, the measure of success was clear. You had a bottle of ketchup and you wanted to sell it, and there was really not much in between. And that model was successful for 50 years. So what happened next? Technology came along, and uh, suddenly we had great opportunity. Suddenly you could track your investment, you could target audiences, you could target individuals on different devices, uh, in real time, uh, and so on. And with this vastness of opportunity, we introduced a vastness of complexity. Yet our head was still in this 50-year-old uh, advertising model. So, to deliver in this environment, um, we suddenly needed more people, different people. We needed to develop more specialisms, more disciplines. There were more stages to actually get from A to B. There was an explosion in the number of things that we could actually measure, you know, and we were all extremely excited about the things we could do as uh, marketers and, and how we actually spend our money on media. And in all this excitement and possibility, this fundamental shift actually happened. When you think about the slides that I showed you before where we had the product and the sale, suddenly we started measure all this stuff in the middle, which is great, which is maybe context but it's not necessarily a measurement that um, highlights the contribution of marketing uh, into, the, into the value chain. So we basically started measuring in increments and uh, bits and pieces and not considering the end goal. We became obsessed with technology and uh, I, I don't know if you work for an organization like that, but. You know, there were bits and pieces bolted on and measurements and correlation and, and this and that, you know, and everyone lost overview of what we measure, why we measure, who owns which piece of technology, um, etc. And I don't know for the ones of you who are, who are older, you know, we all thought, wow, this is the silver bullet. We have now all this technology and it makes our life 
really easy and all the things that we can measure, but yeah, we forgot to actually look at processes and, and people along the way to make this, uh, to, to make this all work. So, we got to a point then, and this is a very interesting one, because um, I'm, I'm a real fan of collaboration and uh, teamwork between client and agency. Um, the clients and agencies um, built their, started to build their own teams, and the clients quite rightly said, hey, media agency, you're the specialist. You set this all up for me and... You know, and I'm sure you all know when the pack of agency people comes to your office to a WIP meeting and shows you amazing reports with pretty pictures and you look at it and then they leave again and you think, well, what was that all about? What does this really mean from a bottom line? And I can see that there are people smiling in the audience <laughs> because they know exactly what I'm talking about. But what, what that actually led to was a lack of ownership not only on the client side, but also on the agency side. And the way clients briefed agencies, there was a, a lack of information as well. So together, separately, we tried to create measurement frameworks that didn't really explain how we reach a common business goal. Um, what I want to show you now, so we, um, <laughs> I'm saying that before I show you, we actually created a, a mock case study and as you watch it, you will find that you have either created one of these or you have seen one of those or in a sales pitch someone said, hey, look at what we have done. But have a look at it and uh, we discuss it a little bit further afterwards. I heard you guys laughing, so <laughs> I know that you have seen that in that you have seen this in the past that a presentation or the agency came and said, "Hey, can we do this case study?" So it's a lot of blah de blah actually, and what is missing in all that is is the insights. There are just a lot of numbers that don't really mean anything. So nothing in there refers to commercial KPIs. So how much have we actually sold based on that? Or what does it mean if someone is a fan? How does this translate in, in, uh, in, a, in a further sale? So what I actually showed you is a pile of vanity metrics that just highlights an irresponsible investment in media. You know, you're, you're better off spending less and reaching your business objective than having something like that. But don't despair, there is light at the end of the tunnel and um, you are actually able to change this within your organization or with the help of your agency. You just, you just have to ask the fundamental question of what is the real objective that we are trying to achieve with the media investment. Um, so what I want to show you now is um, a couple of examples how we worked with clients and uh, with some of them uh, to actually bring meaningful metrics on the agenda. So the first one 
uh, Dust TV cell cheese. So we were working with an FMCG client who has been out of market for a few years. And uh, they said, hey, we want to relaunch our product. Um, they didn't have any research. Uh, they had very little money. Uh, they needed to do this fairly quickly. So what we did, um, we went to Quantium. We created a very basic measurement framework and we simply tested two audiences. We tested uh, audiences that were exposed to a TV ad and audiences that were not exposed to a TV ad, simply because we thought for FMCG, the best way to relaunch is actually, is actually the TV uh, channel. Then we basically let that run for a few weeks. Uh, we did the analysis of the data and what came out of that is that <coughs> People who are exposed to advertising um, buy more cheese. And the measurement, <laughs> the, yeah, it's a fact. Watch it. Um, we had an uplift of 4%, which is great. But we could really measure from the media to how many slices of cheese have actually lost the sh uh, have actually left the shelf, and that was really important. There was the, the the measurement in between. Yeah, it was contextual, and we looked at it. But what executive management wants to see is exactly that number: how much uplift have we achieved? How much more money have we made? Not how how the bounce rate has reduced, or the click through rate, or whatever whatever that is. So that was very successful. But what it also did, and this was a, a side effect of that project. Um, it created an internal change at this organization to actually focus on what is important. And you know, sometimes marketers are seen as people who are a bit fluffy. You know, that really took the fluffiness away because marketing for the first time could actually contribute to the revenue rather than showing pretty reports. So they basically continued on, on that uh, journey to um, look at how they, measure, how they measure their campaign success. The next, one, the next one is interesting with OFX because it was really quite a small change that we have done to their measurement strategy. Uh, this is something that you could maybe do as well quite quickly. So OFX wanted to measure revenue uplift. So Reporting on CPC or CTR doesn't really give you that magic number. So what, what we actually did, we changed the KPI. So we created a common KPI, which was active customers and revenue. And then we reported on that, connecting, uh, connecting basically the media figures with the revenue uplift, so the amounts of money that were transferred. And through that, we could actually prove that the media that we have bought created a revenue uplift. Yeah, does this all make sense so far? And now my personal favorite and highlight of the day is this one. So I disclosed this is done in France with Peugeot Citroën. And um, what we're doing there is we only get paid if our media investment sells a car. So if you let that sink in, the cost per acquisition for media is very high. So when we started to discuss this with, uh, with PSA, you know, we were ready to take a risk and have uh, skin in the game, actually on, on both sides, you know. And I have to say it wasn't easy. So, so the relationship with Peugeot Citroën in France is a 10-year relationship. And out of the 10 years, we spent five years to refine this model. But now this model is profitable for both parties. And what is important to say is it didn't happen overnight. It wasn't easy. Um, there were many tries. They have a custom-built uh, DMP. Um, what the client had to do is give us full control over the end-to-end -end channel, which is a very big... Um, investment in trust, but um, it works. And I'm very proud to work for an organization who was able to pull it off because I don't know 
who else, especially in the automotive uh, category, is doing that at the moment. So I hope that what I showed you in terms of examples is inspiring to a point where you feel, yeah, this is something, something I could tackle or something that I can put on, on the roadmap. And um, what I want to do now is just give you a few tips on what you could do as a start to change this um, within your organization. So first of all, it is really important when you work with, your, when you work with an agency to make sure that figure out if your agency really understands what you're about, that uh, they talk to more people in your business than just the marketing department, that they understand what is actually your high margin or your low margin product. They really need to have a deep understanding of the nuances of your business, your department, uh, the political environment to help you change this measurement agenda and um, push it through. The next thing is you really need to explore how easy is it for you as a business to actually link your product or services to the sales? So do you have the right skills in-house? Do you have the right tools? And uh, there could be a time that you need to set aside for planning to make sure you actually set the scene to get to a more meaningful uh, measurement framework. And I hear many clients saying to me, yeah, we tried this once. You have to be tenacious. You know, it is possible, but you have to give yourself time and you have to have the patience um, to, um, to deliver on this. Another thing that's important is make sure that your management has actually bought in and be patient also with people because what I find in my work, and uh, it is sometimes frustrating when I see marketing people really having great data, but then when you look at C-level or, or executive level, they just look at vanity, you know, and they look at click-throughs or traffic to the site or bounce rates, you know, because that's all they, un that's sometimes all they understand. So as marketers, <laughs> we really have to be patient with management and really explain to them what is important and why is it important and why your measurement strategy actually has to, has to change. The reward of all this will be uh, the following. First of all, how often have you invested in a campaign and you said to yourself, wow, I've spent now, I don't know, $2 million, but I know $1 million is probably a waste of money. You know, with the right measurement, you can actually figure out which of the one million dollars is wasted, and which of the which of the other half is actually worth in, investing in. So what that means is you can maybe reduce your media budget and spend it on digital strategy, whatever, by some Adobe Kit, whatever that might be. You know, but it, it is money better spent. Um, the second thing that will happen is that as a team within your organisation, through better investment and better measurement the role of marketing will actually be elevated as, as you contribute to sales and the bottom line rather than being seen as a cost. So long term it will also be much easier for you to receive funding within the organisation. Um, and if you manage to tackle all this you can even approach your agency and say, well, how can we have a fairer, fairer remuneration model? Actually pay you a commission on sale or pay you for every car that's sold, a coffee machine or whatever that is. You know, it is possible, you know, you just have to be patient and keep at it and change the way you think and um, operate. So to close, I just want to say I hope this was not too confronting or out there. I hope that you agree with me that there are definitely things we can change around measurement 
and reporting. And I hope that you go back feeling inspired, looking at your, your reports and thinking, wow, how could, I, how could I actually join the dots, take out the intermediate metrics and um, change how I do business? So thanks for that. Thanks, uh, Michaela. Um, I didn't see any hands raised, so I don't think you were being too direct, but um, there were parts of that presentation where I felt a little bit nauseous. Uh, looking at that example as a marketer made me feel um, a, a little bit sick. No, 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 just listening to some of the metrics that some of us um, uh, present and, 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 and swallow. Um, I, I don't know if, if, if anyone here is familiar with a book by Eric Ries, uh, The Lean Startup. Um, it's not directly associated with this, except for the fact that in that, he talks about the risk of vanity metrics over metrics that matter. And, you know, he talks about, obviously, you know, uh, the only kind of behaviour that counts that you want to put money into is behaviour that, that, that results in either a sale or that's something that leads directly to a sale. You know, a quote, um, an appointment, a trial, a download of a brochure, sharing of personal details. Um, and if we're going to share something, it's not a Facebook share, it's a a lead that we're sharing. They're the things that we should be capturing and using to, to, to justify and evaluate um, the efficacy of our investments. So uh, thank you, Michele. It gives a lot, a lot to think about. What we'll have now is a panel of, of, uh, of agency people, of, of, of advertisers to come on stage and explore some of these themes in a little bit more detail. So. Would you please join me in welcoming to the stage, first of all, um, can we have the slide? Yeah, great, thanks. Mark Dawson. Um, I've known Mark for a long time. Mark's been both on the agency side and on the client side, and currently um, uh, he's uh, the senior manager for digital optimization at Allianz. Uh, other end, um, Laura Snyder. Um, uh, Laura... Um, uh, is the is the principal for LS Digital Marketing, um, and prior to that, uh, spent uh, 20 years with Dell. Uh, most recently, I want to say recently, over a number of years, was uh, the VP of things like media innovation and marketing technology globally. Um, I'd like to also welcome to the stage uh, Simon Van Wick. Uh, Simon's our our um, author and uh, agency owner extraordinaire, and he has a lot of exposure to the transformations that have been going on in the auto industry for a number of years. And of course, welcome back to the stage, Michaela. Thank you, Michaela. Um, and I'll uh, attempt to, to uh, wrangle a conversation out of us over the next, next few minutes. Um, we will have uh, the, the floor open open to questions. Um, I'll, I'll give, I'll give the, the stage a chance to set the context um, and maybe initiate some of the threads and then I'll, uh, I'll act as, as um, uh, uh, um, uh, the, the, the microphone concierge um, if you have questions. So first of all, I might, um, I might point some, some questions to our, our advertisers on the panel, maybe starting with, with you, Mark, because, you know, you've as I mentioned, you've been on, on both sides um, of this fence. Um, first, we came across each other at Downstream, yep. and then you've been in a number of other, um, you know, client side, you know, media optimization roles. Um, what I'm interested to hear from you is listening to what Michaela said. What what views have you formed on this subject, being on both sides of that fence, and how have you seen that change over the last eight years? Right, okay. Um, yeah, eight years is, I guess, a long time in media. So from my sort of earlier days, agency side, uh, for the digital marketing agency, um, it was primarily search and display. As an agency, we were focused on those two things. And, and measurement and ROI and accountability was relatively easy and straightforward. Certainly from a search point of view, you, you spend a dollar, you get a click, you measure a conversion, and it's fairly straightforward. Well, it's very straightforward. Um, and if that's all you're looking at, it's very easy to tell a, a fairly linear simple story, I think. Um, going to client side now and looking after a wider kind of range of, of media channels and, and different ways of buying that media, some biddable, some IO base, etc. Um, I find it, it's a lot harder to, to 
tell such a simple story and a straightforward story about the role of you know, what each media channel is delivering, what's the right amount of spend by channel, what's the right cost per click or CPM or, or whatever you should pay. Um, how it's really changed over the past year is definitely seeing the rise of more biddable media. It's certainly, I guess, from my background, more my comfort zone, I think, in terms of understanding, okay, if I want to pay X dollars per click or CPM or view, I'm comfortable with that. Um, uh, and sort of learning more about the TV landscape now where you're sort of buying to different metrics. It's hard to get across what a, how tarps work and, and, and those kind of things. Um, so, yeah, I think being on both sides, I've, I sort of now see things from a different point of view, definitely on client side than I maybe did agency side. Laura, um, you know, Dell, you know, you've been, you've been with, you know, you had been with Dell for, for a number of years and... Uh, I guess what what many of us would know of of that brand is it's a very strong, um, you know, results oriented advertiser in a very tough you know market globally. In in the roles you've had, um, what's been your view on on the shape of this conversation and how it's evolved, maybe over a longer time time frame that you've been with Dell? Yeah, sure. And um, you're right. It's uh, quite a data driven. Um, media optimization uh, company. So the pressure's there. I think that the hard thing is, is that um, from an executive management perspective, there are so many things that you can measure that um, the story hasn't evolved over the last 20 years. Um, it's all about visits and then click-through rates and conversions and average dollars per sale. And if you don't give the tools to an executive leader to help them change that conversation, um, it, it, it's very hard um, to be able to enable that. So um, my experience is that if you want to change the conversation, you have to provide alternatives and show that um, measuring in a different way can lead to outcomes that are um, optimizable through, through a different way of measuring. So the example I'll give you there is that we, we all used to and still to a large degree rely on last click attribution in order to measure campaigns. We went through a series of investments and optimizations and new reporting um, to move towards a fractional attribution methodology a, a number of years ago. And it took months of side-by-side -side reporting that showed the old way of measuring and then the new way of measuring in order to change the conversation with the, at the executive level. And once we got through that period of time, then you could start to talk about how search influences um, email, which then influences a conversion on the website. And that will help change the way that you invest in media. You're opening up a thread here which I want to explore in a second. The, 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 the there's a number of actors involved in this story and it's not just the people in marketing. Um, I might come back to you, Mark, for a moment. Um, there's been a lot of press over the last 18 months of um, the lack of transparency in media agencies um, and a massive disconnect uh, between, you know, advertiser and agency and, and, and media. Um, uh, and I won't, be, I won't limit this just to you, to you Mark. Other people, please jump in. What do you think is the reality on the ground? It's hard to say. Like I think, from my time client side, the media agencies I work with, I have found to be transparent. I think I think the people we work with there have always had, <coughs> excuse me, the best of intentions. I've never felt they weren't operating on behalf of the uh, of our client. The, the I forget which side I'm on now of, of the client. Um, but then you read in the press all the time about the lack of transparency, and I don't. I don't necessarily think that's an agency client problem at times. I think there's a lot of, certainly from a digital point of view, technology in between where it gets more and more complex as money passes through different tech and just uh, transparency is difficult when it comes to that. Um, but then you also hear sort of stories about uh, agencies losing money on clients, which is unsustainable. So 
agencies have to still make money and still make a profit. And I think if, if from a client point of view, there's a responsibility there too to make sure that the agency is, is getting paid, they can afford to keep staff, train staff, et cetera, and that's going to cost money, that the more pressure I think clients put on agencies to cut costs and reduce fees, that transparency is going to become a, a, harder, a harder conversation because the agency has to make money somehow. Um, so I mean, personally, I think if, if clients um, pay agencies fairly, but also have an understanding that we see all invoices for media and we have close conversations around how that media is bought and close relationships with publishers, that transparency should be less of an issue, hopefully, or less of a problem. Um, that's my experience so far, but yeah. I'd like to open this up to the agency guys, but before I do, Laura, I mean, you've had a global role here. I'm pretty sure Dell spent a little bit of money um, with agencies. You, did, did you see anything different to what Mark shared? Yeah, no, I, I would have to agree wholeheartedly with that. I, you know, we had a very strong global relationship with Mediacom. Our, it was always based on trust, full transparency, and the group of folks that we worked with um, closely there were always well-intended. It was a great partnership, and I think that um, communication's just the key there and making sure there's alignment around um, objectives and... Um, and, you know, making sure you're able to see the portfolio of bills and do audits and be responsible with how you spend money, um, I think is important. Um, we ended up owning our technology um, so that we could basically own the relationship with the technology providers, but that was really not driven by lack of trust with our media partners. It was, it was only a strategic decision to, to own the tech. So um, I, I, I think that most media agencies are, especially these days, very willing to be transparent with, um, with their clients. Michael, you especially when you're spending a lot of money. <laughs> um, That's on the line. A similar question to your point there, we, we took media in-house for those kind of reasons of, of owning the technology and, and wasn't anything to do with the agency, but more so as we saw uh, media getting more complex and technology getting comp more complex, we wanted that skill in-house mm -hmm. to have the media people and to your early point, marketing, talking to the rest of the business every day about results and about daily sales and about you know, exactly what marketing we're doing with those dollars. Um, that we just needed people sitting in the desks having those meetings owning technology uh, day in, day out. So th th there's a few threads now being opened up, um, the actors and, and now the approach to technology, but I still want to just tease out this, this, this actor piece and maybe um, Simon, okay, if you could, or someone give, yeah, Simon, a, just check if it's, the, it's red, so press the button so it's green. Um, <clears throat> there's, there's three actors appearing now. We've got the agency, we've got the marketing function, but we've also got you know, a, a senior stakeholders on the client side. Um, you know, you, you've, you've been uh, an agency owner for, what, at least 18 years, um, I think, if not longer. A um, lot of exposure to uh, an industry which is arguably, you know, um, ground zero for advertising in the auto industry. How have you seen this play out and the role of these different actors contributing to the, the situation that Michaela has been presenting on? Um, <clears throat> well, I've kind of lived three lives in this space. I've been, a I've been an agency owner um, and uh, I once wrote an article called Why Plumbers Are Smarter Than Agency People and it's true, agencies are so happy to give stuff away and plumbers are just not and there's part of the <laughs> challenge with, with agencies, you know, and now... Uh, and, 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 and I worked with Toyota for 20 years and I was very lucky because they had money for everything, you know, it didn't matter what idea you came up with, we had a budget big enough to do it. And then <clears throat> I've migrated into working on the other side, which is retail side of, of automotive with dealers, quite a lot of them, you know, probably sell one and a half billion dollars worth of vehicles a year. But that's the other side of the whole thing and so sitting on the, the dealer side of things, one I'm still remarkably surprised at how little agencies want to charge for staff but at that end of the, <coughs> of the equation the relationship with 
tools and technology and money and things is entirely different because the retailer only cares about two things, money and, and sales. In other words, can I sell something and, or can I save some money? And so their, their kind of approach to analytics and what they care about and what they look at are entirely different. In fact, they couldn't care about any of this digital stuff. They worry, if you're a car dealer, you worry about the 400 people that turn up in your dealership a month because you know you're going to sell 100 cars. That's how they operate. Anything north of that is my problem and they don't care. Not one of them's ever opened a report I gave them. Not one of them. They'll phone up on a Monday and go, we had a shit weekend and you'll go, oh yeah, no, yeah, you did, yeah. And then you'll do a bit of digging around and you'll find there was a Rodeo in town or something. But, you know, they don't... It's a completely different approach to this stuff. So, uh, Simon, you've, you've sort of come back on this, on this automotive retailer story and, and um, I think this is a nice segue back to Michaela. If you can revisit the, the Citroen a little bit um, as, as a proxy for, you know... Um, people outside of marketing, what do they really care about? Um, and it doesn't seem like they care about marketing. They care about saving money and making money. Um, uh, how, how did, if you can share a little bit, how did this Citroen relationship actually work itself out to be profitable for both you and for them and these dealers? But yeah, well, well, keep in mind uh, the Peugeot Citroen, we actually, del we actually deal with the OEM which is very different to deal with a, uh, with a network because the OEM just produces the car and distributes the cars and distributes it to the dealership network. So they are really interested in keeping the brand alive and, you know, yes, they want the, they want the measurement and the attribution model to point to the fact that we have sold a car, but the willingness to engage in, in that kind of activity and setup is a lot higher than on a dealership level. So in fact, the dealers were just told by the OEM, this is what you have to do. And if, if any of you has ever dealt with OEMs and dealership networks, this is a highly complicated environment with a variety of personalities and, and, uh, and trades. And if you're lucky enough as an agency to have access to the OEM, you know, it's relatively easy. For Simon, it's relatively hard because he actually has to deal with the people who say, I want to mo move metal and I want to I sell a car and who are fairly data illiterate. Um, I, I don't want to give you the impression that that you know the sole purpose of marketing and media is 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 to is to basically be sales support. Um, you know we know it's not not that, and it's not that simple. Um, you know there's clearly you know a fine line to tread there, but there's many more things that we're that we're investing in to keep that flywheel turning. Um, that that are, I guess, beyond the purview and interest of the people that you've just described. Um, uh, which means then, uh, I think, if there is a disconnect, there seems to be, like, I guess there's a phrase of, uh, I read recently that, you know, like, a lot of marketers um, have their eyes, you know, uh, uh, firmly focused on the external change, the external mountain to be climbed on behalf of their business. They forget the internal journey, the internal mountain to be climbed to bring the business with them. Um, maybe coming back to Michaela or, or to Mark, um, what's, what's the experience or what's the, I guess, what's the reflection you have on uh, something that I said earlier, which is our, we have a responsibility to educate or to couch what we're doing in, in ways that those people can understand and care about. I mean, I'm, I'm, I maybe want to say something here. So the essence of my message is that uh, agencies and clients have to work in a partnership. You have to brief us properly so that we can actually deliver proper work. Uh, at the same time, the agency has to show a great interest in how you run a business and what is important to you. And I think there is something missing in some relationships. You know, this is, this is really the essence that I was talking about. As, as uh, 
as digital industry people, we have to work together because it's only getting more and more complex. So if you look at end-to-end -end personalization, you can't have this happening in pockets. So as an agency, we can see that more and more clients actually internalize functions. So as an agency, I actually have to step up and say, well, how can I actually add value to what the client is going to take in-house? Because this is happening more and more. And to be honest, I totally get it why clients are doing that. There is so much IP that you need to retain and decisions that you have to make on an, on an hourly basis. This is not something you can, you can outsource to an agency. And uh, looking at media, it is, there is simply a change happening this is very clear and a lot of media agencies are, are struggling so together at a team we really have to step up and figure out how do we do better how do we sell better how do we measure better how do we make this work in a crowded marketplace uh, where clients are really bored of advertising you know because uh, it's very mess. So how do we personalize, you know? And to do all that, you really need to understand how you measure and how do you action your, ta your data as a team. And the agency needs to take the place as an advisor to add value what many clients are already doing internally to, to for example, take the trading test desks in-house or, or doing doing their own search, you know. Agencies who rely on um, working postgraduates in the ground, churning out ads, you know, they will disappear because clients have figured out to do it themselves, you know. Someone who, who, who oh, I think you wanted to say something there. Yeah, Go. Gee, I was going to say, I've started, I've found with the car guys, because they don't care about any of this stuff really. Um, that I've found a narrative that kind of works for them and I've found it works in other industries where I, I treat the analytics like a doctor treats blood pressure in your weight, you know. And so all I do is look at three things. I look at the, I look at the traffic that's coming in at the top and make sure they're not paying too much for it anymore and it's going to the right pages. That's kind of the health check, that's the blood pressure one. And the weight one is what's, what's the size of our retargeting pool because that kind of implies we're getting people back more than once. And so they kind of look at that and I've found that that's been a really useful kind of narrative to take a call, explain that, you know, all's good with the world and we're, we can move on. Um, and I've, it's actually taken me a while to get there because I drowned in all this data for a while and just found that I couldn't... Um, convert that data into a narrative that anybody actually cared about. And it wasn't most, most of it wasn't actionable anyway. And now I've got a bunch of things that I can actually go look at the top of the funnel we're doing okay, middle of the funnel we're not doing so well. So let's, I don't know, run some re-messaging, let's try another Facebook campaign, let's send an email, let's build some content. And they go, oh yeah, okay, so that's going to increase the size of our re-messaging pool. Yep, you know. Blood pressure down, weight down, we're all happy with the way like it that. works. And it's actually kind of freed up a lot of time for stuff that's more useful. Otherwise, yeah, you just drown in it. All right. Well, I'll hold the question I wanted yeah. to ask you. Now I want to come back mm -hmm. to Laura. Um, just, just riff off that a little bit. Um, I like the, the doctor-patient um, example there. It's a really good one. Um, You've obviously had to manage those kind of internal relationships in your career. Um, how do you reflect on that now? What's, what's worked and what hasn't? Yeah, well, I, I really like the analogy there. I think um, especially if you're dealing with stakeholders that really don't, aren't responsible for driving the demand and they just want somebody to help them get more people on the sales floor and get those people coming back. I think that's, I think that's fantastic. Um, and I, I think the, I, I'm really interested that there's a interest in the retargeting pool and that there's an acknowledgement that that's super important to the business because I think um, those are the most valuable 
people that we have, we spend so much money on getting somebody into the funnel to begin with and to not care about what happens to them next, I think is a, you know, a, a mistake that a lot of businesses make. So um, I love the fact that you've kind of been able to solve that in a simple way for, for the dealers. Yeah, that, that, that was really only because they were losing interest in search because they, they watched a huge amount of money get poured into search and then they had no real way of working out if that was, de de you know, delivered traffic, but they could never tell at the bottom because they're so far away from any of that stuff. And nobody walks in and goes, I was on Google last night, you know. Um, <laughs> so, and here I am. Yeah, and here I am. <laughs> So, so that was just my way of kind of going, okay, let's look at the top of the funnel. We get traffic in. We can kind of bring them back. We've got another much better chance of them finally turning up. And so it's just become a thing to go, okay, we're, that's going up or it's going down. Yeah. Mm. Let's just play that a little bit longer. Um, I'm going to come back to you, Simon, um, and then open up to everybody. Who do you guys think is doing this really well? I mean, I know you had a... Who do you think is doing it really well? <laughs> oh, now I've got to get down and... Any thoughts? Hands? Yeah, I, I think the dimension that kind of not just getting that initial sale, but creating interesting content, like once you are a customer, is a really you know, important part of the marketer's responsibility. I think folks like, you know, Uber have a great interface and they, um, you, know, you think about the next ride or the next thing that you might be able to do with them. I think they have a good kind of simple life cycle program um, that, that kind of keeps me interested and in, yeah, it's just rides, but um, that I think Amazon in Australia is not quite a good example yet, but um, you know, they, they do a great job of engaging users and, and doing a cross-sell and upsell kind of responsibility. Kind of the same, like whenever I think of, uh, of products to spend money on at night, you think, okay, what have I spent money on recently that I bought because of an ad? I can very rarely name something like Uber, Spotify subscription, Netflix subscription, those kind of low cost, really low cost things. Um, and despite every time a new Apple product comes out and I say I won't buy it, inevitably a month or two later I'm in the Apple store going, I'll have one please. And I read a stat the other week where Apple's um, marketing spend as percentage revenue was tiny. And it, everyone, everyone always brings out Apple, but I kind of keep thinking, I've never bought anything, I don't think, of theirs because of an ad, yet I know the ads are very distinct and unique and I can kind of see them. But I'm going to get to the next question. Okay, what if at Allianz, hopefully not too many people from Allianz in the room, what if we took all of our marketing spend for a year and just put it into better website, better product, all the things that... Um, those teams at times are struggling for budget for when marketing have bigger budgets. What would happen if you just put it into focusing on the product for a year? I'd be out of a job pretty quickly. But but it's those kind of things where you think, okay, in the, you sort of you know you lying awake at night. You think, does marketing is the money we're spending really changing um, the business metrics, or were things going to happen regardless of whether we spent that money or not? Were people in Apple's case, were people going to buy Apple Watches regardless of the advertising campaign or just because they like the brand, like the product, like the user interface, that kind of thing? All non-marketing kind of things. Dive in, Simon. I think uh, I've spent a fair bit of time with the info product marketers and no one really wants that stuff and they still manage to sell it to yeah. people. And they are so... The Ezra Firestones of the world and... Um, they're amazing. The, the detail, level of detail and the amount of analytics that those people consume to sell a product at the end of a nine-stage funnel, it's amazing, you know, but you can't... I mean, we, we would have masterminded in this one couple there run a sort of sex, health and education thing, and they, they knew the difference in conversion rate between a woman in stockings and suspenders and whether it was black or white they knew that there was 23% more convert. I can't even remember the detail. It was so, there was so much of it. But, you know, those guys are really good at it. But it's very hard to take that environment into a, a corporate area where you've got 15 meetings every day. And Thank you, Simon. Um, on that note, I don't know about you, I'm starting to feel a bit hungry. Um, 
and it is lunchtime, so would you please join me in thanking our panellists for that marathon session. <laughs>